Three weeks ago, Jasper, Daria, and I spent a full day exploring Bangkok's J Festival, a part of the world's largest vegan event. More than 40 million people participate in J each year, and for nine days and nine nights, the streets of the kingdom turn yellow, with flags representing meatless food, snacks, and delicacies in honor of the occasion. So we thought, all right, let's do a video where we talk about vegan food. That'll be an easy one. Except, the more we started to unravel the story of Thailand's vegan cuisine, the more intense and controversial it became. Before we knew it, this had turned into something spanning a dozen countries, multiple religions, and even including the origins of stuff we take for granted every day. This is not the story we set out to tell, but it is one that deserves to be told. The history of Buddhism and food, and the story of Asia's vegan cultures. And oh yeah, that festival, which was I think what this was supposed to be about in the first place. In 1944, while London was in the middle of World War II, a kind of dining gained popularity. So-called attic clubs, where people would meet in safe houses or private homes to supplement their rations and share a few glasses of gin while bombs rained down overhead. The most popular attic club tradition involved friends or neighbors chipping in to buy a pig, then cooking the whole thing and feasting together. But it was in London's attic clubs where people who didn't eat meat began to connect with one another and organize into groups. Vegetarian clubs formed across the country and then they began to split into those who ate eggs and dairy and those who did not. Finally, in 1944, a newsletter was sent out by the director of the Manchester Vegetarian Attic Club, taking a survey of what name should be given to the most conservative non-meat eaters. A number of options were considered, but in the end, the choice was vegan. And that's how the term first appears, less than 80 years ago. Now, the idea of veganism goes back a lot longer than the 1940s. Even in the West, there were those, especially among Quakers, who practiced a vegan diet. And if we go back a lot further, many Greeks of the classical era followed something called apochi emsichon, or abstinence from beings with a soul. But this would go out of fashion with the rise of Christianity. Throughout time, every religion and every system of beliefs has been guided by some version of the basic premise of don't kill. But how that's interpreted can vary dramatically. To some, it means don't commit murder. To others, it's a general premise of nonviolence, and others still take it as meaning all life is sacred down to the very smallest microorganism. But then sometimes, there's a split within a religion itself. And that's where our story starts. Okay, so my favorite is uh, Chinese sausage. I cannot walk past Chinese sausage without adding it to anything. This is just my weakness. This looks like a vegan version of that. So I'm gonna get this. Uh, khao soy hub. Uh, okay, I'll do one, one khao soy. It's just after breakfast at Bangkok's most fascinating food court. It's called the Vegetarian Community of Bangkok, and it feels like a trip back in time, with hand-painted signs and the hum of the ceiling fans and the prices. I mean, every dish is sold for less than a dollar. And then there's the fact that here, the food is literally farm to table, with everything from the vegetables to the rice grown, harvested, and cooked by members of a local vegan Buddhist community. I love the ethos here as well, which is very much like, you know, you see clean up after yourself, there's garbage separation outside, uh, there's no, that looks amazing too. There's no, for lack of a word, better word, uh, BS about this. This is very much, they practice what they preach. Uh, it's, it's awesome. So? You forget how good vegetables are straight out of a garden? Well, we don't really eat many vegetables to start with. 
not completely far from the truth. Mm. Now, all right, this is where the story starts to take a turn. This might look like a friendly and delicious cafeteria, and it is for sure, but it's also owned and operated by a group called Santia Sok, an organization that split from Thailand's mainstream Buddhist religion in 1976 and accused them of being lax in their faith. The two sides would fight a very public war over their interpretations of Buddhist doctrine, especially the idea of eating meat and for a while their fight would almost tear the country apart. We did a video on that, by the way, if you want to know more. But the point is, these two interpretations of Buddhist doctrine are at odds with each other, and that can cause a fair bit of conflict and friction. Now, the reason why some Buddhists believe in maintaining a vegan diet while others don't, including the mainstream in most of Southeast Asia, well, that is the story we're trying to understand. And that all begins with another religion, one that emerged almost 3,000 years ago in the same part of India where the Buddha would find enlightenment. And this would be the very first belief system ever recorded to forbid eating meat. A few hundred years before the advent of Buddhism, the first reference to a vegan culture appears in the history books. Well, actually not the history books, more like the poems. Homer's The Odyssey tells the story about a tribe from North Africa called the Lotus Eaters, who survived on nothing but the fruit of the lotus. Now, it's reasonable to think that might have been fiction, but the story was actually corroborated 300 years later on an island northeast of Tunisia. Anyway, our story begins further to the east in what's now India. At the time, Hinduism was widespread, which followed the principle Ahimsa, an ancient Sanskrit word essentially meaning do no harm. The Hindus interpreted this to imply non-violence and a humane treatment of all creatures. But around the 8th century BC, right at the time as the Odyssey was written, a new religion would emerge in the Ganges River Basin. It would be called Jainism, and to the Jains, Ahimsa was meant literally. The Jain diet would be the first true intentional meatless diet ever recorded. I can't say vegan because technically they did consume dairy, but otherwise it was intense. Jains would consume no meat. They'd also swear off root vegetables, potatoes and onions, garlic and ginger because ripping anything out of the ground could harm insects living in the soil, and because a plant's roots are still alive and food should only be eaten if it truly doesn't cause any harm. Now, this is not a story about Jainism, and it's just background, but it is safe to say that everything that comes after from the creation of vegan foods, to the growth of vegan beliefs, to the food festival where we're ultimately heading, all of it comes from the Jain interpretation of Ahimsa. As of 2023, there are approximately 6 million people on Earth who follow the Jain religion. They're obviously mostly concentrated in India, but that doesn't mean in Bangkok we can't find plenty of Jain options. In the part of town known as Indra Plaza, close to Pratunam, there's an entire industry catering to the thousands of Indians who do business in Thailand, especially trading in textiles and electronics. Here there's a street packed with vegetarian Indian restaurants, I mean, India today is 44% vegetarian, and there are as many as 250 million pure vegetarians. Basically vegan, except dairy is permitted, because what is Indian food without ghee? Anyway, most of these restaurants can prepare any meal according to the Jain diet. You just have to ask. So that's what we're doing at a place where Daria and I eat frequently off the air, looking for Bangkok's best dosas. When you say that you're going to take something and make it Jain for us, yeah, 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 how sure. do you make food Jain? What does that mean? Sure. Actually, usually Jain food, when you order time, we make separately for you. 
now no onion no garlic no potato so jain people little bit coming that time especially make for them this is everything this is a south indian version of jain food specifically coming from the state of tamil nadu the first Jains came from further to the north, but Tamil Nadu has a history of Jain influence since the 3rd century BC. At its core, Jain food is based around rice, together with foraged nuts and plants and stews of legumes like lentils. Here we have a breakfast called idli, steamed rice pancakes fermented for only a few hours according to Jain custom, and served with coconut chutney and a lentil stew. There's a thali set, rice with small portions of things like green beans, sour mango, stewed vegetables, and fresh yogurt. And of course, the dosa. This is a very most popular dish in South India, especially from Tamil Nadu. It's making with rice. This, this is, a, in Tamil Nadu people usually take this for their breakfast. So every day they take this uh, dosa, idli, uttapam. There is many variety of dishes, more than 50 varieties of dishes. Usually they take normally. Now, there's not a straight line from conservative Jain diets to what groups like Santi Asak consider vegan Thai food. But there is a line. And to tell that part of the story, well, we need to pick this up around 2,500 years ago with the very beginning of Buddhism. So there's a legend about the Buddha's last meal, supposedly in the year 483 BC. On the night he would die at the age of 80, he'd spent his day traveling, and along the road, he'd stopped for dinner at the house of a village goldsmith. He'd eaten and then continued on, but that night, when he knew his last breath was coming, he'd committed one final act of selflessness. He sent word to the goldsmith that not only should he not blame himself, but that the meal had been a blessing, and one of the most significant in his long life. By the way, that sacred meal was wild boar. See, the Buddha himself was not a vegetarian. Not only did he eat meat, but so did his followers, and he never called for anyone to consume a vegan diet. It would be a thousand years after the Buddha's death before his religion would become associated with the Jain definition of Ahimsa. And by that time, Buddhism had long since spread across Southeast Asia, which is why, in case you're wondering, mainstream Thai, Lao, and Burmese Buddhists eat meat. Anyway, this is where we get to the split. And it starts around the year zero, when Indian Buddhist missionaries reached the Chinese Han Dynasty palace at Xi'an. The religion would quickly spread through China, but as the saying goes, with Chinese characteristics. See, at the time, most Chinese were followers of a philosophy called Taoism, the yin and the yang, the light and the dark, etc. This was deeply ingrained in Chinese philosophy, and so to fit those rules, Chinese Buddhism would take on compatible characteristics. For example, there were ancient sects that claimed that Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism had actually been the Buddha reincarnate, or had been reincarnated as the Buddha, or even that he himself was the Buddha. Anyway, early Chinese Buddhism would take on a lot of different forms and beliefs, and it wasn't helped by the fact that few in the country could read ancient Sanskrit to actually understand the meaning of the small amount of imported literature. There were groups who replaced enlightenment with the concept of eternal life groups who focused primarily on meditation, best known as Zen Buddhism. And then, around the year 500 AD, Indian translators arrived, and they interpreted the ancient Sanskrit texts to mean the same as they had to the Jains, including the part about maintaining a vegan diet. Now, this would only apply to monks and the highest religious nobility, but it was enough for what we now call vegan cuisine to begin to take form. Chinese monks in Xi'an, the ancestral home of Chinese Buddhism, favored a local dish made from soybeans in the style of a Mongolian cheese. That, of course, is called tofu. 
In the South, as a replacement for the ubiquitous fish sauce, monks found use in a condiment originally intended for the poor who couldn't afford more expensive salt. That, of course, would be soy sauce. Seitan, the greatest of all Chinese meat substitutes, was actually invented by monks through a process of extracting the gluten from wheat. And that's not even to mention perhaps the most enduring outcome of the spread of Buddhism. The reduction in alcohol consumption led to the public accepting tea, and the arrival of tea culture across the continent. It would be Chinese Buddhist monks who would spread their own version of their religion, first to Korea, where it's credited for the widespread acceptance of kimchi, then to Japan from where soy sauce, tofu, and seitan would all spread to the world. And finally to the islands of Southeast Asia where Buddhists in Indonesia would invent another meat substitute called tempeh, in some history books credited to Japanese missionaries. Anyway, basically what I'm saying is starting about 250 years after the Buddha's final meal of wild boar, his religion would travel two important paths. First, the so-called Theravada branch, which traveled from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia and which follows the permissive teachings of the Buddha himself. And the Mahayana branch, which spread from China to the south and east and teaches a diet based on a strict interpretation of Ahimsa. And those two branches would thrive independently until they'd collide, suddenly and in the most unexpected way, in Thailand, 2,000 years after they first split. The smell of seasoned chicken is as much a part of Bangkok in the morning as monks receiving alms and backpackers staggering home from Khao San Road. And finding the best stuff in this city, well, that would be almost impossible. But finding something awesome, well, that's always around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, at the very least, we can start the video we set out to make, arriving at the J Vegan Festival, the nine days a year when Thailand enters the multiverse. When even vendors we see each day suddenly start serving different stuff and when meat is out of the picture. And this is our fried chicken for the morning. Thank you. All across the city, local cuisine is reimagined during the Jay Festival. Like at Kini Puffs, where instead of chicken curry and roasted pork, today Jean's curry puffs are made with vegan curry and taro. Or here at a cart that sells Kanamjin Namya, the ancient rice noodle dish made with a rich fish based curry, for J Festival done with the mushroom stock. This, by the way, is Salon. It's in central Bangkok and it's somewhere we come for food all the time. So finding things like a cow gang counter serving seitan pad kapao and tom yum with pineapple, well, it's somewhere between jarring and incredibly exciting. If you've ever wondered what Saku Sai Mu looks like without the Mu, uh, it's this. He's rolling the glutinous rice dumplings. I'm curious what's inside. I guess that's peanut and uh, most likely pickled radish, um, at least based on the color. There's probably some brown sugar, palm sugar in there too. Uh, it just looks great. And then over here we have fried chicken. That can't be vegan. There's no way that's vegan. No, that's, that's just fried chicken. That's just fried chicken. The Jay Festival is both vegan and Buddhist, and as you probably guessed, it's Chinese in origin. Actually, Jay in Thai comes from Chinese, the character Jai, which means abstaining from animal products as well as onions and garlic. But actually, it means a lot more than that. It means the basic rules for everyday life that govern all Buddhists, as interpreted by the conservative Chinese monks. 
Basically, to keep this part simple, there are five rules or precepts that guide Buddhism. I mean, all of Buddhism. And they are, in a liberal sense, don't kill, don't steal, don't overindulge in pleasure, don't lie, and don't do drugs. And this also helps to make sense of why the Indian translators in ancient China believed that Buddhism was actually meant to follow Jain rules, because they recognized the five precepts as the same followed by the Jains, with only one exception. And actually, the Jains, with their strict interpretation of these familiar rules, well, they don't call them precepts, they call them vows because they only apply to monks and nuns, which is exactly how they'd also be applied in Mahayana Buddhism. And that's why Jain cuisine was so important to this story. Anyway, for Chinese Buddhist monks and nuns, there are actually eight precepts. The original five, plus three more, which were said to be applied directly from the life of the Buddha himself. And a person who follows these eight rules in their most conservative interpretation would be considered a follower of Jai, or J. So that explains what the J festival is. But it doesn't explain why a celebration of the rules of Chinese Buddhist monks, the same rules that caused a split between, as just one example, Santia Sok and mainstream Thailand, suddenly takes over this entire country once a year for a massive nine-day food festival. And that brings us to one last story. In 1825, according to the legend, a famous troupe of Chinese opera singers sailed to Phuket, where they were to perform in the village of Katu between today's Old Town and Patong Beach. But when they arrived, many in the group became very sick. Now, some stories say that the singers themselves prayed for help. Others say it was the rest of the troupe who prayed not to become sick. But either way, the opera singers turned to the gods. Now, we're far enough along in this video that you're probably like, wait a minute, this is Buddhism. What gods could those be? And you'd be right, but don't forget the Chinese had made some tweaks to allow the Buddhist faith and Taoist philosophy to coexist. These were Taoist gods, and specifically the stars in the Big Dipper, known as the Nine Emperor Gods and the ultimate deciders in matters of life and death. But to win their favor, the singers would lean on their Buddhist doctrine. And to be precise, they'd turn themselves over to Jai. They would follow the eight monastical precepts with a fervor that would impress even monks. They'd give up their comfortable beds for mats on the floor. They'd eat only once a day and no more than needed. They'd wear the simplest of white robes and they'd follow a monk's vegan diet. And they recovered. Phuket's Chinese community was in shock, amazed at the miraculous healing. So each year, they'd commemorate the occasion by honoring the nine emperor gods and the Buddhist sacrifice those singers had made in their honor. In Taoist tradition, the first nine days of the ninth month of the lunar calendar is when the emperor gods visit their earthly temples. And since 1825, Thai Chinese have celebrated those dates, first in Phuket and then everywhere, including the streets of Bangkok, where as many as 10 million people participate in the festival every year, wearing white and sleeping on mats or just here for the food, which is as good as you'd think it might be when 1,500 years of Chinese vegan tradition mixes with the multicultural magic of Thai food. Do so you remember how I said recently on the channel that the best part of Chinatown is not Chinatown, it's all the little streets on the outskirts? That doesn't count for today, because whenever there's a big festival, anything over the top or massive, that is where this is the place to be. It took us a while to get to this part of the story. This was an adventure that even after everything we've covered barely scratches the surface. There's pretty much the entire meaning of Buddhism, the history of the Thai religion, the influence of the Mon people, and a million other directions that deserve to be explored. 
This stuff is just astronomically complicated, and I'm a cook. I mean, we're a food channel. But at least now we know what we're here to eat. I really, I'm not gonna put my mouth on that. Ah, I can breathe. It's been almost 3,000 years since the lotus eaters lived off the coast of Tunisia, and since the introduction of the Jain diet, adapted from a Hindu principle meaning do no harm. And it is tempting to use this time at the end of the video to moralize about how much harm we've actually done as a society thanks to our addiction to meat, the rainforest clearing and the factory farming and everything else that's got us as a species pushed to the brink of oblivion. And that's not even talking about the moral complications that come from taking a life, no matter what belief system we might subscribe to. But the truth is, that would be the height of hypocrisy. Because I'm not a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian, and I'm literally on camera every week eating pretty much everything, so I don't get to pass judgment. But statistically, a lot of you probably do. Currently, 22% of the world's population doesn't eat meat, and within 15 years the number is projected to surpass half of everyone on Earth. Plant-based diets are the single fastest growing category in global food, and while there are a lot of reasons behind that surge, it's very possible that one of the biggest is this, the stuff we ate today. Now, I might not be a vegetarian, but something I've never really mentioned on this channel before is I did grow up in a vegetarian household. But as a kid in Virginia, the idea of ordering vegetarian food in a restaurant was horrific. You'd pretty much just get a salad, or if you were lucky, some ghastly version of a veggie burger. Being a vegetarian was punishment, and being a vegan was unthinkable. But today, as the world has gotten smaller, one of the consequences is that vegetarians everywhere are starting to gain access to the dishes, ingredients, and recipes that were developed over thousands of years in Asian countries. And I don't know, at least to me, it feels almost ironic that in Thailand today, a country devout in its Theravada Buddhism, there's nothing even remotely hypocritical about waves of young people eating foods developed by Mahayana monks sold in upscale shopping malls and trendy cafes for the simple reason that it's delicious. And that is something that we can all believe in. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps to keep us going. And thank you so much to those of you who do. Find the links below for Instagram and social media, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.